Well, I'm glad to see everybody here in our church. I'd like you to turn to the book of John. Would you do that, everybody turning to the book of John? And uh, you're probably thinking, I wonder, wonder how he rates. He's going to get to sit down through this whole sermon. And generally, the, the preacher doesn't get to do that. But there he is. And Pastor Howell helps him up there. And uh, it's, I wonder how he rates. Well, I want to tell you how I got here, OK? You don't want to do it. <laughs> it has to do with COVID and a concussion and a lot of other stuff that's going on. But I'm certainly a lot better than they thought I would be. And I'm really glad to be coming back to the church for the last few weeks. And uh, now I actually get to speak to you about something extremely appropriate. You know, God's in control. Pastor talked to me about preaching some Sunday. Then it came to January the 31st, that's today. And uh, that is the last day of the 21 days of our Bible, uh, reading our Bible, uh, 21 days. And I tell you, I could see right away what the reason was. For me to say something to you today, not that it had to be me, but I knew what was to be said. John chapter 15, would you turn there? John chapter 15. Now, my wife is here, she's always here. And I've gone a lot because I'm a traveling preacher. I've been doing that now for 13 years with my membership at First Baptist Church. And so often she's at First Baptist without me. But now, of course, uh, she has come with me. I actually need her to drive me over here for several reasons. I'm going to make myself sound really decrepit, but I'm really not. I'm a lot better off. But, you know, if you can talk about how bad you are, people feel sorry for you, and that helps you out. But anyway... And uh, we came this morning. Did it snow where you were? We live in Vassar, way out in the east in Tuscola County. I mean, we're way out. That's where we live. So we drive 25 miles into uh, uh, First Baptist Church. And uh, this morning, the challenge wasn't necessarily the snow, although it was. It had to do with this. Uh, some months ago, while I was gone, my wife came over here. And she ran into a deer. I don't mean visually, I mean physically. Car, deer. And I think I was away and she told me, guess what, I hit a deer. Oh, that makes you feel good. And then when was it? I think the next day? The next week she was coming to Bridgeport and she hit another deer. Yeah, so that uh, the corner out there in the country where that all happened, we call it Deer Acres. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, I didn't really think we should go on and go through Deer Acres today. There's another way to come, but we did. And it was very snowy and we were nervous. Then my wife said a little bit after Deer Acres, I don't think I should have come this way. And I agreed with her about that. But we made it safely and so did you. And it's so we could read this verse. I'm excited about what's happening at our church. I really am. Now look at verse fifth, chapter 15 and verse 7. Jesus said, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Would you read that verse with me? Okay, we're going to read it one more time, and I'd like you to join us. Ready? Verse 7, this is Jesus Christ speaking to his disciples the night before he died, preparing them for what was to come. And he said this, ready? If, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall, and it shall be. Now, did you get what that said? That's one of the many verses in the Bible I call wowee verses. It's a verse you read that has something phenomenal to say, but you just pass right over it. If ye abide in me, whatever that is, and my words abide in you, whatever that is, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now you'd have to go to seminary to try to drain the meaning out of that verse. But verses in the Bible mean what they say. He said, under a certain condition, you're going to be able to ask for anything, and it's going to happen. You know what I would call that? A miracle life of answered prayer. 
regularly getting our prayers answered. We're talking about direct and specific prayers where we say, God, would you do this? And he does it. Whoa, I think I could handle that kind of life. Yeah, actually, John chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 yeah, uh, make a record one talk Jesus had the night before he died where he prepared them for what was to come. And what was to come was the New Testament era, the most blessed era for the people of God the world has ever seen. And it was going to begin when he went away. And uh, I'll tell you, you ought to study those chapters. And it has a lot to do with answered prayer and miracles. Wow. Living a miracle life. And specifically, it gives us the role and place of the words of Jesus in the miracle life. See, we've been reading now 21 days, and uh, that's good and important for a Christian to do. And our pastor has been given wisdom about that to lay the groundwork for a deeper Christian life. People do things at First Baptist Church of Bridgeport that are unusual and phenomenal. And I'm talking about regular witnessing, praying, that's all great. People do not think, do things that a lot of church people do. We have a pastor who is concerned about us and uh, warns us against uh, some of the uh, false teaching and some of the wrong living being done by Christians in the Saginaw area. And that's great, but I'm going to tell you something. There is a need this year for us to be deeper than that. Not just don't do this or start doing that or even read your Bible every day. There's a reason to read your Bible every day, and it's not just a check off today. <laughs> See, and one of the most powerful reasons is what Jesus said would happen if I would abide in him and if I would let his words abide in me. Wow. What would happen? to my prayer life, I'd be able to ask for anything, and there it happens. That'd be a pretty good day. Get up in the morning, abide in Jesus, have his word abide in me, ask for something and have it happen before I go to bed at night. Tell you what, it would be worth getting up in the morning, don't you think? Now, in the context, in John chapter 15, he's explained to them how they will live the Christian life, and it's by abiding in me. And I won't go into detail about that, but he tells about that. And uh, the way that really goes is, in verses 1 through 6, he says, the key is me. Salvation is me, but also the Christian life. You don't walk away from the cross after you get saved. Mm -mm. You stay at the cross. There's a great book, you ought to get it and read it sometime, called The Calvary Road where the writer discovered at the end of the 1940s that the Christian life, you don't just go to the cross on the day you get saved. You go back every day. Amen. Wow, an amazing thing to learn. And so, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, verses 1 through 6, says, if you abide in me, you will reproduce. Don't we want to see people saved? Yes. Did you know, winning other people to Christ isn't just about trying harder, do it again this week, learning what verses to use, although I'm glad I know what verses to use, knowing what questions to ask, knowing sales, twist somebody's arm and make them pray with you. No, seeing more people saved has to do with me and Jesus. If I abide in him, I will bear much fruit. Okay, that's what we've got. Now, verse 6 says, If you abide not in me, the abide in me life is not automatic if you're saved. And matter of fact, it says, If you abide not in me, you will wither. Save but withering. Then verse 7, the one we just read, says, If you abide in me, you'll flourish. You'll ask what you will, and it'll be done. The abundant life, the miracle life. You and I can live the miracle life. Wow. 
Verse 6 says, if you abide not in me, you wither. Verse 7, if you abide in me, you flourish. That's what this is about. Now, I want to talk right now about his words abiding in me. The word abide means to remain or to live there. I came to Jesus, chapter 6 of John, and I got eternal life. I learned from John 15 to abide in him and I'll have the abundant life. It's very simple, but it's a tremendous thing. Okay, I remaining him. I live in him every single day. Okay, and if his words abide in me, that means the word of God is not just something I believe or something I hear a man preach from. It means if his words will actually live in me, dwell in me, be a part of my life every day, then this miracle life can happen. That's really fantastic. Now, I don't, you guys know the Bible, and I don't really, be honest with you, expect that you'll be able to answer this question, but I'm going to throw it out, okay? There's a place in the Bible devoted to a young man who decides to clean up his life with the use of the Word of God. It's a chapter. What chapter would that be? What chapter? Who would say, I've read a chapter in the Bible, that that's what it's about? About a young man who wants to clean up his life. He wants to be a good Christian. And he finds that what you use is the Bible, the written word of God. What chapter is that? You're allowed to talk out loud because it's just me. Come on. Psalm 119. Now I'm preaching from John 15. I won't preach very long. But I think it'd be smart if some of you turn to Psalm 119, okay, if you appear to be smart. And you're going to look at, we're not going to read every verse, verses 1 through 25. Psalm 119 is famous for what? See, you failed my last question. But now, what about, Psalm 119, though, is a famous chapter because it's the longest chapter in the Bible. It's really long. But it actually tells a story. The story is a young man, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Okay, he had a dirty life. I need to be clean. Blessed are the undefiled in the way. I'll tell you what, the fortunate people in the world are those who know God and walk with God, but that's not me. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto. According to thy word, according to thy word. And I'm going to get into that. That's verse 9, if you have your Psalm 119 open. And it refers to verse 25, which is a prayer. Quicken me according to thy word. According to thy word. Okay, now quicken is translated from the same Hebrew word as the word revive. When he prays in verse 25, quicken thou me according to thy word, what he's saying is revive me according to your word. See, what I see here, I want to be here. See, about Jesus it says, and the word was made flesh and dwell among us. And what you did in Jesus, I'd like you to do in me. Not on the same level, he was deity. But the word of God becoming reality in my life. And that has to do with his words abiding in me. Now, if you have Psalm 119 open, we're going to look at verses 1 through 25. But I won't take that long. And uh, you don't really have to have Psalm 119 open. But it'd be interesting if you did. Okay, now, he says, I'm going to find a way to let the Bible do its work in my life. Man, it's going to be great. And in the first few verses, it gets into the project, which is verse 19. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Not just by gritting my teeth and trying harder to be a better Christian. No. But by taking heed to my life. Some of us just need to do that, young or old. I need to pay attention to how I'm living. <laughs> by taking heed thereto according to thy word. And I've got to get the word of God 
uh, into my life. It's really quite a wonderful project. Now, the following verses, he refers to the written word by various terms. And maybe you'll see what they are. He calls it the law. Did you know God calls his law, not just Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, but the whole Old Testament? I can think of a verse that refers to the Psalms as God's law. See, unmovable and the standard, thy law. And then in this section here, verses 1 through 25, his testimonies, his ways, thy precepts, thy statutes, thy commandments, thy righteous judgments in those first 25 verses. Those are terms referring to the written word of God used again in Psalm 19, not too hard to remember, Psalm 119 and Psalm 19. These are phrases or terms referring to the written word of God. And uh, so he's going to use this to change me. Now, that's what we're talking about today. The night before he died, he said, if you abide in me, and if my words abide in you, you'll get to the place you can get your prayers answered all the time. Wow. Man, that's fantastic. Now, what am I going to do? Verse 11, if you're looking at Psalm 119. Thy word have I hid in my heart that, that I might not sin against thee. That's memorizing Bible verses. Yes. Did you know in Bible days they had big sections of the Bible memorized? Did you know that Bible Christians in the New Testament didn't have a Bible? Maybe there'd be one for the whole church or down at the synagogue. But I mean, at home, they didn't have a Bible. They didn't have a pocket New Testament. They didn't have an Old Testament and New Testament. And yet you hear them quoting the Bible in the book of Acts. You know how? They had it memorized. Long sections of scripture memorized, which was the route to take. Thy word have I hid in my heart. They memorized scripture. Verse 12 says, teach me thy statutes. And there's another verse where he says, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. The last chapter in the book of Luke indicates that we need to go to the author of the Bible and ask him to open our eyes. And I'm going to tell you, friends, it works. We have the Holy Spirit living inside us. He's the author of the Bible. He's now, I wrote, I've written another book that's coming out pretty soon. I'm sure you're all going to rush to the bookstore to get it. But I've written the little book, Back to Normal. One reason a lot of the folks in our church have read the book is it's short. And uh, I like books that are short and easy to understand. But you know what? Let's say you got really interested in my book. And you bought the book. And you got reading the book. And then I was in church. And uh, you know what you could do? You could say, you know, chapter 2... You got me confused, Brother Flanders. What did you mean by this? And if you did that, I tell you what, I would be complimented. I'd feel good about the question. And I'd answer your question. The author of the Bible lives inside you. He literally does. And you know what? He will teach you the truth, according to the Lord Jesus, the night before he died. Wow. So... I'm memorizing scripture, and I'm praying to the author that God will open my eyes. Okay, now I'm letting his words abide in me. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy word. Okay, now that's verse 13. Okay, with my lips have I declared. You know what that means I need to do? I need to talk about it. Yeah, that'll help you a lot. See, I'm trying to get the words of Jesus to live inside me. How do I do that? <clears throat> I memorize them. Then I talk about them during the day or maybe church. How many have ever been to church? How many of you occasionally go to a Bible teaching church? <laughs> Where you could go to someone and just say, you know what I read this morning? I never saw the connection between verses 10 and 11. But boy, they connect. 
I'm telling you, that's a part of the whole deal of having his word abide in you. And that is, memorize some of it. Ask God to teach you his statutes. And also, declare them, speak them to other people. Verse 14, I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies. Enjoy the Bible. You know, there are people even who went through the 21 days and read the scripture, Pastor. I really think there are people in the room where it's still a chore. Boy, I hope he's happy. I've checked off all 21. (laughs) Boy, I hope he is. And now it's Bible reading time. I'm going to get up three minutes early in the morning to read my Bible. And I'm going to read it, all the these and thous and King James stuff to make them happy at Bridgeport. Whoa, here I go. And I'm going to tell you something, friends. That's no way to get the word of God to abide in you. You need to rejoice in it. There's a lot of great stuff in there. You might even say to your wife, have you ever seen this? Whoa, you know what that means? That means the Lord is bigger than the devil. And I can resist him and he will flee from me. Whoa, I like that. See, what we need to do is we need to enjoy the word of God. And then verse 15, I will meditate in thy precepts. Now, I was taught uh, many years later than I should have that we ought to memorize some of the Bible verses and then meditate on them. I wish I went, what on earth does that mean? Okay, meditate means taking the verses you've memorized and say them to yourself. Matter of fact, the one who taught me called it personalize the verses. Yeah, Uh, blessed am I when I do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But my delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, I meditate day and night. Uh, You personalize it and say it to yourself. Well, I remember when I learned that, I said, man, that sounds like something good to do. So I had to drive to Vassar. All of you know where Vassar is, not a very big town. And there's a couple of traffic lights. And I was saying one of the Psalms that I had memorized to myself, that's called meditating, came up to the red light. And you know what? Stopped and was still meditating on God's word. And then I was there too long because I didn't even notice that the light had changed green. And the people around me were not real happy. Uh, My big example of early meditation was that a guy was going to take me deer hunting. Now, I'm not really a hunter, but people in our church are. And out where I live, there's lots of deer, they tell me. And a friend took me over here. I had a gun. He said, I'm going to tell you, just stay right here and wait. It was very early in the morning. Deer apparently like to get up early. But anyway, I was there, and he said, you just wait here for a while, and a deer is going to come right out of those trees and then blast him. (laughs) So uh, the deer didn't come as quickly as I thought it might. And I was sitting there, and I was waiting and waiting and waiting. And I have learned that this meditation thing works when you're waiting Uh, Not that I go to the hospital that much, but I've had that kind of test that you take where they put you in a hole, run you in there, where you have to be perfectly quiet for a long time. Here's what you do. Take every verse you ever memorized and say it to yourself. You'd be amazed. Well, I was doing that out there in the woods, waiting for Bambi's mother, and or father, father. So about, I was saying every verse Did you know you've memorized a lot more verses than you think you have? I started out. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And that was because I've heard it preached. And I've read my Bible a whole lot. So I was saying one right after another. That's all of Genesis 1, I know. But then I was saying these verses to myself. And you know what? I don't know if uh, Bambi's father ever showed up. But I'm going to tell you, I was so taken away of that situation in my mind and so thoroughly in fellowship with God that I wouldn't have seen him if he had shown up. Wow. Meditation. Pretty amazing thing. Now, you know what we ought to do? 2021. You and I ought to have a miracle life. 
where we're getting prayers answered all the time. You never doubt if there's a God when you're getting prayers answered. And also you have a lot less trouble when you have prayers answered. I'm thinking about a member of the country church I pastored for all those years who uh, sometimes irritated people because she would tell you the truth. You know, if you were just talking, you know, about this, she would say, you know why that is? It's because you blah, blah, blah. And even family members didn't like to be around her. But I had one of her relatives say to me, you know what? Aunt called her name. You know what? Sometimes she irritates us. She's pretty forceful in her opinions. But I'll tell you one thing. If you need a miracle, you ask her to pray for you because they always happen. And I knew it was true, and I'm not a relative. Wow, it's an amazing thing. So what we need to do right here, and we're going right into, and we are already into 2021, we need to get serious. Not just about how much we like our church. I like our pastor and our church, don't you? Not, but real serious about God. And there's hardly any way to get serious about God without learning to abide in Jesus and let his words abide in you. When I read John 15, I find out to abide in Jesus will make my prayers effective. He doesn't answer just everybody's prayers, but he'll answer mine if I abide in him. And that'll make my prayers effective. But if his words abide in me, It'll make my prayers informed. You know what? The word of God lets me know what God is like. Let's me know what God likes, what God doesn't like. Let's me know what God will do and what he won't do. And I'll tell you what, an intelligent prayer warrior can get things done. Because he understands what God is like. Man, that's great. Just absolutely great. So <clears throat> if ye abide in me, this year. And we're especially going to talk about that tonight. If we live a life in partnership with our Savior, and if his words abide in us by reading, studying, asking for guidance, memorizing verses, meditating on God's word, I'll tell you what, we can have a miracle year which is what we really need to have. So right here at the end, that's how you can tell I'm getting done. It's when I tell you I'm at the end, okay? Uh, I want to say that I'd like myself and you to make some decisions about some critical things. Number one about you and Jesus. If you abide in me, how is it that I abide in him? By loving him. See, you know how you come to love Jesus Christ? Romans 5 says, if you will receive Jesus Christ, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. Now, on the day I got saved, I was thinking about my need for God. I don't remember all the details, but what I did was what you need to do is I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. I saw that I didn't just need religion or church. I needed someone to save me from my sins. All my life I had been taught that that was Jesus, but I didn't know what it meant. But on the day I got saved, I came to Jesus Christ as a sinner and trusted him to meet my need, to save my soul. And you know what happened? A whole lot more than that. My name was written in heaven. My sins were washed away. But then the love of God was shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. When I got the gift of eternal life, I also got with it the gift of the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost came in inside, he brought something called love. Love for God and love for man. I remember going to church as a kid, finding out I was supposed to love God with all my heart and love my neighbors myself. I said, that's impossible. <laughs> I don't even know God. I've never seen God. How can I love him with all my heart? And how can I love my neighbor as myself? Well, the answer happened on the day I got saved. The Holy Ghost came in and he brought love. Love for God and love for man. 
And that's where you start in abiding with Christ, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ by trusting him as your savior. Abiding in him is also about how you live after you're saved. Chapter 14 of the book of John, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Did you know that that is the Christian life? (laughs) Some people think the Christian life is a pleasing First Baptist Church by living a life acceptable to even Sunday night people. See, it doesn't have anything to do with that. You know what the Christian life is? Loving Jesus and doing whatever he says. I need to say, I love you, Jesus, every day. This is Rick. I'm waking up. Lord Jesus, I want you to know I love you. Maybe not as much as I should, but I do love you. Is there anything you want done? Is there anything you want done? I'll do it. One of the places in these chapters I talked to you about, he says, you know what? You're not just my servants. You're not just my disciples. You're my friends. And he goes like this. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if you do whatever I ask you. Wow. They didn't know that tomorrow they would see him give his life for his friends. But they did. And then from the cross, it's as if Jesus said, are you my friend? I'm your friend. You've never had a better friend. Now will you do whatever I say? And you know what? I'm talking about abiding in Jesus. I want you to make a decision about you and Jesus, which would be, I love you. I'll do whatever you say. Maybe about an issue you brought with you to church today. Just say, I'll do whatever he says. If I knew what it was, I would do it. And it's because I love you. Let me ask the Sunday morning crowd at First Baptist Church. Does it matter to God what your motive is for doing the right thing? If you tithe during uh, stewardship month, does it matter to him that you do it out of love? Does it matter to Jesus what your motive is just as long as you're at church and that you're faithful to your wife and that you give out tracts? Does God really care what your motive is? I think you know it's in there. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 13? It's the chapter about charity and charity means he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I'm a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. He says, if you can get up and speak eloquently, if you don't do it out of love, it's just noise. Read that whole chapter that way. He's saying in 1 Corinthians 13, I not only want you to do what I said, I want you to do it because you love me. See, and remember the church at Ephesus, they were warned by Jesus Christ. He was the head of their church that he would chastise them or bring judgment on them because they had lost or left their first. It means everything to Jesus, why we do what we do. And you know what we need to do? We need to love him and keep his commandments, which is basically abide in me. There's the metaphor he tells in this chapter. He says, I'm the true vine and you're a branch. The goal is that you reproduce, that you multiply, that you bring forth fruit. If you abide in me, if you stay connected to me, you'll bear much fruit. Yes, you will. That has to do with dependence. See, like the branch of a grapevine is dependent on the vine for the life-giving sap that'll bring out the grapes. I not only am committed to the person I love to do whatever he says, I'm utterly dependent on him. I'm not even able to obey him without his power. He said, without me, you can do nothing. I need to trust him. I was learning this abide in me life when I first started traveling for the cause of revival. And I had revival meetings in New Mexico. And uh, when I was there, of course, I'd been praying a lot and looking forward to what we were going to do. And that uh, morning, that first Sunday, uh, 
They were going to invite folks to come, boss folks. And I was going to start the, the revival campaign by preaching a salvation sermon, and I was praying that people get saved, praying that God would help me preach the right sermon and preach it abiding in Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what I wanted to happen, and I want to see people get saved. So I don't know anybody. I'd never been there before, and they come in a pretty good crowd. Uh, after church that morning, we were going to have a, a meal. We were going to have uh, food. And we had a cook from a local Indian reservation who was making very good food. I'm told it's very good food. So that's how they were going to. So we're, I'm up there on the platform like I am now. I don't know anybody at all. People are coming in, of course. So I decided to use my head. Once in a while, I do that. And uh, I turned to the pastor. I said, I, in a few minutes, I want you to let me know of any lost people that are here. Remember, my whole sermon was to lost people. There wasn't one word to a saved person. <laughs> Not a very smart way to preach. But that's where I was. So I said, let me know. So now we're coming down to like the last song. And we do a stanza. And I look at him. I said, what do we have? Do we have any lost people here? And he looked around. And he looked around. And he said, no, not one. Now there, uh, there's a lady over there. I was hoping her husband would come. She got saved a couple weeks ago, but he's not here. So not one. Then Brother Howell, you know what I said? I said, well, I'll just go with it. After I said, I'll just go with it, I thought to myself, what on earth did you mean by that? And uh, what do you mean I'm just going to go with it? <laughs> I got a salvation sermon. Everybody here is saved. That doesn't make any sense. And, uh, but then I went back to my verse. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. That's what I thought. And nothing magic happened, but that's what I thought. And then, you know, uh, five people walked in. Now we're right at the end. It's uh, almost preaching time. Five people walk in, sit in different parts of the auditorium. I went, oh, oh wow. And then the pastor turned over to me. He said, those people aren't Christians. Came in at the last minute. Later on, I found out that, uh, well, they were diff different people who had invited people. They came at the last minute. And a couple of them were hitchhikers. That church members had met at a gas station and invited them to come over and to have that meal. And to preach. Well, anyway, I, I preached the gospel. And we had four of them come forward and get saved. And a lot of things were thrilling. We had the meal, we were out there eating, and I was watching church members discipling new converts over the meal. <laughs> Pretty thrilling thing to see. A man came up to me and he said, Brother Flanders, I've never heard you before, but I tell you, you're good at giving an invitation. You're really good at giving an invitation. Look at all those people who got saved. And in my mind, I thought, if you only knew... <laughs> This had nothing to do with my ability to give an invitation. I would never know how to give an invitation and get four people saved. I don't know how to do that. It wasn't about that. It was about abiding in Jesus. And he was doing it. Yeah. See, so uh, me and Jesus, you and Jesus, if you abide in me, then I'll just say this, then I'm through. You in the Bible. Now, we read a lot of Bible this past month. I hope we got serious about the Bible. I remember when I first got saved, people said, you need to read the Bible every day. These and thou's and King James. Man, oh man, I don't know if I can do that. But I did. I started out by reading one chapter a day. Somebody said, read a chapter a day, which seemed monumental. And then, you know, after a little while, I started reading two chapters a day. I doubled. Then after a while, maybe a year, I started reading three chapters a day, then four chapters a day. And you know what that would do? That'll put you through the whole Bible in a year. See, one, two, three, four. By then, you know what I would do? Memorize a verse every week. And you know what? Usually out of my Bible reading, I'd say, now, that'd be a good verse for me. I memorized it. When I was very early on, probably one chapter a day, I was having a problem. And I'm going to be open with you about it. I was having a spiritual problem. So I memorized a verse about that. 
And the verse was this. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Probably means that Flanders was having a problem with my temper. I was a Christian now, but I had to tell myself, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. She made you mad. No, that's the wrong way to put it. But it's not going to work the righteousness of God if you get mad. So I memorized it and I would say it to myself. And you may want to pick a verse that applies to the problem that you're having right now. Yeah. A memory verse. You and your Bible. The amount of Bible you read every day. And the memory verse. And then you try meditation. Give that a try out hunting this week. Driving down the road. Pay attention to the traffic. But enjoy yourself by speaking the word of God to yourself. And soon you will live in the Bible world. You'll live in the Bible world. Reality. The devil says all kinds of lies. But you know what? You get the word of God to live in you. You'll live in the Bible world. And it'll be a great experience. And you'll know what God is like. And you'll know what he wants for your life. And you'll be prepared to pray effectively. Then the other thing is, make a decision about you and Jesus, make a decision about you and the Bible, make a decision about you and praying. You don't have to be on your knees. It doesn't have to be a certain time in the morning. It can be throughout the day. Where I address my Father in the name of the Son, with the help of the Holy Ghost, with all the promises in John 13 through 17, that God will hear and answer our prayers. I tell you, it's a great thing. And you don't just have to do it at a certain set time. You ought to have a set time. But you can do it all day. Talking to him all day. Trinitarian praying to the Father in the name of the Son with the help of the Holy Ghost. And he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, You'll ask whatever, and it's going to happen. Wow. Now, I'll say this. Tony, that's my wife. Raise your hand, Tony. Hi. She has to raise it high. She's a little bit diminutive. She's short. Uh, you talk to somebody who knows this is true. I'm not going to give you my story, but, of course, I got COVID, then I got dizzy, and then I fell down, hit my head, got a concussion, I've had all kinds of symptoms that since last October, I get physical therapy, a lot of stuff happened. But you know what else happened? Lots of answers to prayer. I mean, an atheist could be in this room and we could start telling you the story since October. He'd have to say, well, there's something to that. <laughs> Amazing. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. You know, if that wasn't true, Jesus Christ would be sticking his neck out to say it and have it put in the Bible. But friends, it is true these days. At the end of our services, usually somebody says, you'll want to come forward. And did you know all these stairs couldn't be to get up here? That's a lot of stairs. Really, it is. You know what they're for? They're for people kneeling down and praying. Somebody at the end of the service will almost always say, do business with God. Now, you may not have any idea what that is. We come to a good church that gives an altar call. And we say, do business with God. And if you came to the front, you may think it means just kneel down. It's nobody's business what you're saying. But I'm going to tell you what you need to do. The business you need to do with God is you need to make a decision. You need to make a decision about Jesus, about the Bible, and about praying. And friends, you can move up to higher ground with this simple sermon and you coming to your knees, not just to pray and do business with God, but make the business, the issues between you and him. Talk to him. I would say, Jesus, you know what? I don't always act like it, but I do love you. And I want to be in the habit of doing whatever you 
sake. You in the Bible, meditation, praying for God to enlighten you. You in the Bible, and you in praying. You know what, this thing that I worry about, I ought to be praying about it. And I believe God will help you with your decision if you tell him about it and say, on this day, I am sincere from the depths of my heart that I am going to love you and keep your commandments or that I'm going to start meditating on your word or whatever. Tell him what it is. Then you know what I would do? I wouldn't just tell him. Make the decision. Tell him. I'd tell somebody else. That's one reason that pastors are up here in front. One of them maybe can show you how to be saved if you're not saved. But you know what? You ought to tell somebody anyway. It'll be a much more thorough decision that'll make a difference. If you walk up to Brother Cowling, you say, Brother Cowling, you know what I just told God? And you pray for me that I'll follow it up. See, because we're given an invitation, so you make a decision. Not just come to the front and pray, but make a decision. Tell God what you're deciding. And then tell somebody else. And let's walk out of this place different. Different. Abide in me. My words abide in you. And then we're going to start asking for things. I'd like you to look at me and then I'm going to close. Who would say, Brother Flanders, right now I have something in my mind and in my life that calls for God to help us. A desperate situation calls for divine intervention. Right now, I have something that I ought to pray about. And if God came through for me, it would be a tremendous thing. I've got something in my life right now I ought to ask God to do. And I want you to know about it. And I'm letting you know by raising my hand. Who would that? Come on. Okay, I'd like you to decide that we're going to see that the words of Jesus are true. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Would you do that? In just a moment, I'm going to have music played. That's what we always do. Then you're going to walk right up to the front. Who would say, Brother Flanders, I need to have my life changed. I'm talking about my schedule. I'm talking about what I do about the Bible. I'm talking about my prayer life. I need to have my life changed. I know I do. And you know, Brother Flanders, if you're questioning whether you preached on the right verse, I want you to know you preached the right sermon because it was for me. And I need to have alterations in my life, and I know I do. Pray for me during the invitation. I will if you'll raise your hand. Dear Lord, let us become abide in me people that are affected and directed by the word of God. May things really change in our life and in our church, starting especially this last day of the 21 day project. We ask you this. With our heads bowed, I'd like us to stand up, please, right now, everybody standing up. And if you're ready to come and tell God about a decision you're making, I'd like you to not wait for anything else, but come on and find a place to pray and then tell somebody about it. But if you are contemplating a huge change in your life, being made by the Word of God, why don't you make a commitment like the one that the psalmist spoke of in Psalm 119? Taking heed to your life according to God's Word. And the Lord gave you some ideas. Now tell God about it and then tell somebody else. With our heads bowed, who would say, Brother Flanders, I'm not even a Christian. I don't know Jesus Christ. I need to know him. I'm a sinner who needs a savior. And if somebody could help me, I would like to receive Jesus Christ. I'd like you to raise your hand, please, so I can see who that is. We'd like to help you and we can help you. People are praying all over the place. There are preachers down here. If you're not a Christian yet, not a saved person, I'd like you to come down right now while she's playing the music and come to one of the preachers, somebody who looks like a preacher, and say, I'd like somebody to lead me to Jesus. And if that would be you, you'd be the one that comes right now.
Yes, Pastor Howell. us to be. Having Dr. Flanders speak about getting serious, a real relationship with Jesus Christ. If we're truly going to have only God, we've got to get serious. Like he said, it's more than just checking off a box. I read my Bible, that's a great start, but God cares about the motivation. He cares that you're driven by love for him. It's not enough just to check off a box or show up here at church. Can you imagine what God could do? In little old Bridgeport, if we have a church full of Christians who are serious about Him, serious about their relationship with Jesus Christ, serious about the Word, about prayer, He told us He'd be miraculous. Our prayers would be answered. Sometimes even before the day is over. And I love what He said. It would make getting up worth it. I wonder, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if someone else says, you know what, Pastor? I should have responded earlier, but I need to respond now. I need to spend some time with God. I need to make a decision this morning. Maybe you're here and you've never trusted Jesus Christ. We'd love to open a Bible and show that to you. Maybe you're online and same thoughts through your mind, call the church. Well, someone over the phone give you what we call the plan of salvation, the gospel. My friend, don't leave today without responding to God in the right way. Thank you for touching us this morning. Thank you for Brother Flanders, Lord, but thank you for your word, the truth there. Lord, help us to be serious. Lord, to each day abide in you. And Lord, we're so thankful for the privileges, the promises you give to us because of that. Lord, may you take these decisions that were made, would you cause them to prosper? Lord, may we see the reality of what a Christian life with you looks like. And Lord, I'd ask if someone's here who did not make the right decision today, Lord, that you would convict and touch their heart. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.